ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Roberts. It's always a pleasure to speak to such an enthusiastic audience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hello, my name is Daniel Roberts. Uh, I'm a solution architect um, uh, working for MongoDB. Um, I started uh, at Mongo, oh, well, it was TenGen when I started. When we first opened an office in Europe, there was like one guy called Jerry based in Dublin, and there was another guy called Alvin who flew over from California to see what was going on in Europe and to see the, whether there was anyone using MongoDB. And there were a few people, there was like Telefonica in, uh, in Spain and the Guardian newspaper in London and a couple of others. And uh, he came over with the express, express remit of, for goodness sake, don't open an office. And for whatever you do, do not hire any employees at all. And so like two months later, he'd hired his first employees and we'd opened the first office here in, here in Europe and we've kind of grown ever since. And we've now got uh, MongoDB people across Scandinavia, across Southern Europe, across Spain, across Italy, across France and Germany, uh, London, and we've got a big support office in Dublin. Have I missed somewhere? Benelux. Benelux, yes, we've got a bunch of people in Benelux. So we've actually got what, about 65 people here in, uh, in Europe now, uh, whereas there were, back when I started in November 2011, there were 65 people in the whole company globally. So it's really, it's kind of grown quite massively. And uh, we're now at, what, probably three, 370, I think, globally? Yeah, somewhere between 350 and 400. So, um, so I'm actually a, a recovering uh, Oracle employee. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I think I've, I've just about recovered after a little bit over two years. And I think uh, um, w one of the great things I was looking forward to about leaving Oracle was coming and working for a a startup because it was uh, you know a it's an exciting place to be, but also working for lots of working working with lots of great startups who are building great and cool technology. And of course at MongoDB there are there are loads and loads and spades and spades of people doing that, especially where our office is in London around Shoreditch. Um, so it's always great to go out and see and work with lots of those people. But I think what's really astonished us um, over the last 18 years time, uh, and who's, who's used MMS, Mongo Monitoring Service? No? It's free. Okay. Yeah. okay, you absolutely have to check out Mongo Monitoring Service. Well, actually, it's not called Mongo Monitoring no, Service because it does more than monitoring. Uh, Mongo Management Service. Um, go to uh, mms.mongodb.com. Uh, and it's a cloud-based environment uh, where you can monitor your MongoDB instances. And so if you've got a MongoDB instance on Amazon Cloud or wherever, you can install an agent and it pings every minute metrics and there's like pretty graphs and you can see trending over time. You can look at the metrics and look at the, look at the internals of MongoDB and understand uh, what's, what it's doing uh, in different parts of the product. And I, I think even if you don't use it, uh, in production, uh, which of course you know literally thousands of people do, uh, using MMS um, uh, gives you a great insight into the understanding around how MongoDB works. So it will tell you about the flush process of getting data onto disk. It will talk about things. Uh, uh, you'll be able to look at queued readers and queued writers. How many things are waiting to do something? It'll give you insight into lock contention and a bunch of other a bunch of other interesting things. So MMS is interesting because uh, essentially. Uh, ingests a huge volume of uh, this metric data from thousands of uh, thousands of MongoDB instances across the globe, um, and does it in a kind of really in a high volume way. It has some very specific architectures, uh, architectural setup, and specific uh, schema designs to ensure that uh, you can read metrics uh, very very quickly, and you can see your insights very very quickly. Um, it's interesting, I, 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 they used, we used to send out internally the metrics of, uh, of MMS, uh, but it was a reasonable sized database. I think they, they probably deleted a lot of old data, but it was kind of around 150 terabytes at one point with kind of billions of documents, metric yeah. documents. So really interesting stuff. Um, so MMS, sense data, smart meters, all those kind of ad-serving type things. And of course, financial data, uh, which I guess tick data, ticks, like eating ticks, like this kind of guy. <laughs> No, not, not that sort of tick. <laughs> They're not very nice, are they? These kind of ticks, financial ticks. So we're, we're kind of thinking about market data, those share prices or currency prices or commodity prices, which 
kind of fired off from uh, people like Bloomberg and those kind of stuff. Um, so for, for us, uh, like I say, we've done a lot of work in financial services over the last 18 months or so. Uh, all kinds of use cases, but this kind of lends itself to, to some that we're, we're seeing increasingly. Um, uh, and, I, and I guess when you're ingesting lots of these ticks of data, they're very, very small, uh, very small items of data, and there's an awful lot of them at huge volumes and huge rates. And I guess uh, we see them at different kind of sizes. Uh, uh, typically, you know, a small tick volume would be something like 2,000 ticks a second, whereas some of the big uh, financial uh, guys, they're, they're like distributing sort of 2 million financial data points per second. Now, of course, if you're trying to store that in some way in a something like a MongoDB database, or well, how do we ingest two million do documents per second? And I guess that's one of the key points around ingesting large quantities of data like this, is trying to understand uh, how we should actually capture that data. So, so rather, with this kind of problem, rather than thinking about, oh, what's our document per second insertion rate, it's kind of we need to start thinking about actually how many data points per second can we ingest. And I guess that cons consequently leads to the question of how many data points per document should we store and how would we store those. And so data points often kind of come out to being the best idea of, to think about things. And the reason that we kind of think about data points in conjunction, in conjunction with the schema design, we kind of then think, well, actually, what can we leverage out of MongoDB to, to, to kind of be able to support these kind of loads? And if we think about Mongo and its kind of key, um, its key characteristics, it, I guess the key things are that, that really lend itself to this kind of problem is the idea of data locality. And so if we think about a relational database, each time we ingest a row of data, each time we ingest that entity, it could exist anywhere within your database, within your disk, within your system. So I insert a record, some more come in. I want to select a set of records. They don't necessarily come from the same place. Uh, and so if we can kind of group and bucket data together, uh, then that actually can give us a great advantage around performance and around ingesting data. So data locality is one of those key concepts, I think, which the document model, and certainly how we store those documents within the database, really, really lend itself to, to great performance. Uh, of course, memory map files as well, which we talked about caching, uh, and of course, in-place updates, which also kind of plays that lo data locality type notion. Anyway, so um, so here are the kind of, uh, I guess at the base level, um, we did some kind of relatively simple benchmarking internally. Um, and we also had to, uh, we've had a customer as well doing some benchmarking as well, because they've been looking at this problem, where they can, whether they can use something like MongoDB in place of rather expensive specialist databases for storing kind of metric style data. Um, so I, I guess when you first start thinking about this problem, you think, okay, well, I want to store some tick data. Uh, that's going to essentially going to be a, a financial symbol. Like, so Goog, Google Shares is an example. Um, it's going to have a timestamp associated with it, and then it's going to have some prices associated with that as well. What I'm going to buy it at, what the bid and what the offer is. Uh, and what the quantities are to sell at it. And so it, it's pretty easy to kind of think in a relational model, certainly, or we'll, we'll just stick an item in per record, uh, a data point per record along that. And in the testing I did, um, which actually isn't that great, uh, I think it's probably due to the loading code that I wrote, but so this is kind of really, um, uh, uh, this test is really in, uh, to see uh, comparatively. Uh, we started off with a, a data insertion rate uh, of one single data point per document and gave us around 2,000, 2,500 document inserts per second. So not that great, but uh, this is kind of comparative. Uh, and we're running on some hardware, we're running on Amazon EC2, uh, and what, we, what I was, uh, really wanted to do was try and remove as much potential disk I.O. out of the equation as possible, and so we ran, it on a, uh, we ran these tests on an SSD insert. And so, kind of, that was okay. So, we kind of thought, well, okay, that's fine. We're inserting a single document each time across a shared infrastructure of Amazon EC2. We're not going to get that greater results. That's fine. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to test out some of the new uh, batch style input, uh, batch style inserts. So, uh, as he was talking about this earlier on, about how in 2.6 we've got a new bulk uh, bulk loading tool. And in fact, in the version I did this testing on which were a preview of something like 254, um, 
we're actually using the run command. So uh, the run command, um, which you can use from your own drivers, uh, things like your Python, Perl drivers, whatever, whichever languages you use. Uh, I did it from a Java driver. Uh, and essentially, you build up this is a run command as opposed to a uh, typical insert. And essentially, we, we can batch up an array of documents uh, and push them in uh, in a single in a single go. So that's great. I mean, insert one load of documents and get a response back. So we did some testing with kind of different sizes of that. Uh, uh, and actually, we kind of uh, worked out that, um, you know, for, for a batch of documents, for these batch of these single tick documents, we were, we were kind of, uh, we could get a, you know, optimum around 100 documents per batch. <coughs> and that gave us an effective number of data points, or ticks, as we got in this particular example, of around, around uh, nine or 10,000 data points per second. So we're still thinking about, we've got the same amount of document inserts, but by being clever about how we, store, how we insert that data using the batch write, we're removing a lot of the to and from -ing. So immediately we're seeing that actually we're, we're ingesting data in a little bit more quickly. So that's good, that's given us a bit of a, bit of a boost uh, using batch insertion. So that's kind of like four times the size, right? Uh, so yeah, if you're ingesting a lot of data, use 2.6 and use the bulk loading tools uh, and APIs. Um, so, so that's good, but what about, uh, how about actually this inserting each individual data point per document still doesn't give us a great improvement around, uh, around data locality. And so uh, one of the other options which we explored was how about we actually take that, those data items and, and insert a large quantity of those data points per document. Uh, and so what we did uh, was we looked at saying, well, let's take, let's take those ticks and let's batch them up into, well, bucket them into, into a document. And so in schema design, in Mongo, uh, it's r you should really typically try and design your schema based around how you typically interact with your data. And so if I want to query a page worth of data out of my database to display on my web page, if I can actually get all that data in one single document, that's going to be much more efficient from a kind of a query. I could potentially do a query, a single page fault if the data's on disk, and return that back to my application to be able to store that, uh, store that on, on, on disk, uh, store, uh, store that back to my application. And so by doing the notion of bucketing this data, building up these complex documents um, of different sizes, we can kind of get, a, a, get an even greater effective data points per second. So in the first instance, we were getting I could, store, I could store two and a half thousand data points per second in single documents. Uh, but now actually, if I actually take those, uh, take those bucketed data points, uh, then I'm getting an effective throughput of somewhere in the region of about 60,000 or over 60,000 data points per second, or in our example, ticks per second. Uh, and so <coughs> that's, that's a great, great way of actually ingesting a large quantity of data. And so we see people doing this. We see the people doing this in the financial services market. We see people doing this in, for metric data. And we see people doing this for, for social data as well. Let's batch it up, store it in buckets, and then use it in other interesting ways, uh, ways in course. Uh, so of course, the lo next logical step, of course, is, well, actually, what happens if we combine both of these two things together? And we actually take our buckets and combine them with our batches and actually then store them together, uh, actually use that. So take a bunch of bucketed data types and then push them into our database. And actually with, a, with tweaking and looking at, at our example within our application, we actually kind of came to, uh, we kind of managed to get circa sort of 90,000 effective operate, uh, data points per second by bucketing and batching that data and storing it, storing it in Mongo. So that's kind of that's the work we did internally around kind of um, uh, how we'd actually uh, ingest greater numbers beyond the number of document insertion rate. For instance, in your application, if you've got your setup is faster, we are, as I say, we're on Amazon EC2, uh, which of course has sometimes questionable or uh, performance. Um, then doing that uh, on your own hardware in your own environment with a much greater document insertion rate, we can of course get larger and larger rates than that. And so what we did, actually, I had a customer, um, a, a hedge fund in London, and they were looking <coughs> at how they, could, uh, how they could actually go a bit further and how they could actually uh, store an awful lot of data 
uh, very, very rapidly. And they were looking at how they could actually remove some of their existing databases and use MongoDB. And so they actually, what they, they, the, the question they asked themselves was, how much of the data which we're ingesting, and I think if we're ingesting an exceedingly high rate of data, uh, how much of that data do we actually really need to read at any one point in time? And actually, can we store that data in such a way that the effective throughput is considerably <coughs> higher? And so what they looked at doing, uh, in fact, what they have done in their testing in POC is they actually take a stream of data, take a stream of financial data, and they actually batch it up and compress it into fields, into binary fields within MongoDB. So the trade-off for them is that the data they actually need, they can store in metadata calculated. They can always go back to the data they need if they wish to query it, uh, but they can actually batch it, compress it, and effectively what they're doing is they're creating a column orientated database uh, within a bunch of documents and bucketed across different, uh, for them across time and across different uh, uh, financial metrics. And so this kind of style of storing data has meant that these guys can effectively uh, take somewhere between three and five million data points per <coughs> second uh, and store those into MongoDB. Now, on a single server, we'd never imagine, we'd never anticipate putting that amount of documents into into the database. But to support the actual requirements of their need, uh, then what they've done, they've managed to get something pretty, pretty effective for them, based on their requirements, based on the data that they wish to look at, um, and store that in an interesting way. Any questions? So, what about the data? That's just the data from the some. Uh, a given transactional data from a given um, or a particular transaction or session or something or just uh, what's this data? Yeah, this this uh, this, 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 this data is all not a single document. I mean, I mean the compressed document. This is what are, what what is the entropy of this data? It's like it's single transaction. Data. So so uh, a, a document will contain a set of prices for a particular financial instrument over a period of time. And so they'll go in and store that, uh, or all those things, store them, find them in there, um, and then give them, give them a huge throughput. So this would work for any kind of sensor data of some description. Uh, what they do is, it, within the application, they take a level of metadata around information, mm -hmm. the data which they need to query. And then often we find in financial services, they want to go back and crunch the data at a later point or a later date in time. But actually storing the data is, is, is difficult. So kind of the, ne the next point, the next problem we kind of have though in this scenario is is then to kind of well what is what is the what's the scale out architecture of of our application and certainly in my testing and I don't know whether you guys have seen this as well when you're adjusting large quantities of data it really depends very much on on the performance of your of your disk the performance of your I/O within your environment and. If you, if you kind of look back and think about, or certainly if I go back two years and look at two years ago when we were talking to customers, what the typical environment was, um, it, it might be Amazon EC2, uh, it would be a single EBS volume, typically, uh, which isn't that fast, uh, or they'd be running in, a, in their own hardware and having uh, some kind of um, uh, single spindle disks, so very few SSDs around sort of two years ago, or certainly uh, out in the marketplace there wasn't. And, uh, and so, so we'd always recommend that you give MongoDB as much RAM as possible, give MongoDB, uh, try and get as much into RAM as humanly possible, which is, which is still the case. Um, but never ever imagine sticking uh, multiple MongoDB instances uh, on the same server because they end up contending. And, and that is still very true. <coughs> Uh, today, um, but actually less true when you've got some, some really high I.O. within your infrastructure. And that's kind of what we're seeing right now, uh, and what I'm seeing a lot of customers uh, and companies doing, is that actually, can a single MongoD instance saturate some of the really, really fast disk, uh, disks which we're seeing uh, now? in the marketplace. And so in my own testing, and, and it's not really conclusive because it was, it was relatively uh, uh, simple, uh, but 
the testing I was doing, well, I was kind of getting to a point with my MongoD instance where I was only saturating about 10% of, of the SSD instance. Uh, yet there was still quite a lot of scope on the server and on the CPUs to be able to, to run more MongoDB instances. Uh, so we've also seen, uh, I've seen customers looking at this as well and, and coming to the conclusion, especially when, uh, so I'm, I'm, SSDs are fast, but if you look at something like Fusion IO type, are you familiar with Fusion IO? Fusion IO, I'm starting to see in uh, customers where the the underlying, um, uh, it's not SSD, it's actually a PCI-based RAM, which is battery-backed. Which, So if you think of a typical spindle disk with somewhere around the region of 500 IOPS per second, and then you go to a good SSD with about, uh, I don't know, what, 30,000 IOPS a second, let's say, for a reasonable SSD, and then you go and look at something like Fusion IO type cars, this RAM, battery-backed RAM, uh, they're kind of operating around 800,000 IELTS per second or maybe more. So, so consequently, you've got a huge amount of throughput. And so the only way that, uh, that we can actually get anywhere near a saturating that amount of disk is by actually doing, introducing this kind of controversial concept of, of what we call micro sharding. And what we mean by that is actually wrapping up uh, a bunch of uh, MongoD instances on the same physical tin. Now, it's only going to work where you've got considerable disk I.O. I wouldn't recommend doing it anywhere uh, other way you've got some you know, really fast SSDs where you can't saturate them or where really fast where, uh, where you've got uh, something like Fusion I.O. And so actually within some of our architectures internally, some of the, uh, some of the services we have to support uh, the management service, uh, then, then we're looking to build out and use that architecture um, to, to saturate and get the throughput which we need. Um, I think MMS is something around the region of like 75,000 75, 75, uh, operations a second. Um, and we actually do that on a relatively small cluster, but we actually uh, manage quite a lot of MongoDB instances on that particular instance. So yeah, so uh, rack them up, uh, see, uh, and then I guess the key metrics then are, are looking to, to leverage how much of the disk IO we can use uh, by monitoring things with MongoStat, and also then using MMS to monitor uh, actually monitor what's going on within the actual server and the performance of that. Um, some of the customers we're working with are actually looking and investigating this based around C groups. They need C groups to kind of constrain. Here I've got a server with say, uh, I've got a server with say 48 cores or something like that. Uh, let's rack up the amount of cores. Let's give each one of the say something in the region of two or three cores um, and rack it up that way. And so rather than in the old days where you'd have, if you ended up page vaulting, where you've got a single spindle disk, uh, you'd be page vaulting would be very expensive, so it'd be going from a very uh, uh, low latency query, serving something out of RAM, going to a very high latency query when we're going out to disk, because we're actually moving disk, physical disk in, uh, spindles away. Kind of a page fault in something like a Fusion IO card is more like a kind of bump in the road as opposed to uh, as opposed to a kind of huge hitting a wall that you might get with a single spin. Okay, so um, so the other thing I just wanted to talk about was was uh, was introducing this idea of kind of analytics um, from a um, um, just to finish off uh, within this concept of having a bunch of data which we're storing and how we can bucket data and how we can uh, how we can store that in such a way. Uh, that kind of gives us some um, uh, insight uh, to our data without having to go back and run a query which calculates our stuff. As much as we can create ahead of time is always going to be great for us, right? If we can calculate stuff whilst we're inserting data, then, then, then that's good. So, um, so Mongo actually has helped uh, in this next release as well with some other new op incremental operators. So if you're familiar with Mongo, you're familiar with the dollar increment or increment values. Um, within MongoDB in 2.6, we now have this dollar max and dollar min, uh, which only increments the value if it's greater or less than the previous value, which was, was in that particular attribute. But it's not to be incremented. And you could something an explicit value. You could expect an explicit value, but not in a single operation, because you need to know what it was beforehand. No, 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 I'm saying, but you could min and max also support just setting a value to dollar set, unless it's not small. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. So if it's bigger, it'll accumulate it. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm saying like a, like a possible. If this if this value is smaller than what's already there, then store it otherwise keep the other value. Yeah, isn't that what I said? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 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 so, so, so that kind of scenario again in, in this the financial space. This is kind of financial market data. Um, when people want to store this kind of data, they, it's kind of, they want to take sort of over a t t series of ticks of data, we want to store a, a high price, a low price, and, a, and an open price and a closed price for that period. So data over, a, say, an hour, I want to know what the highest price was, the lowest price, what price that period started with, and what period that's, uh, that series ended with. And so these kind of candlestick charts are fairly common. Um, and so the red ones, the open price was at, at the top where the, where the thick part is, and the closes at the bottom where, the, uh, uh, where it ends, and the, kind of, the wicks at the top and bottom show where that price has gone up to and down. And so if you think you're ingesting a stream of data at one point in time, uh, you want to be able to figure out uh, those values as you insert that data. And so with, with, with dollar max, dollar min, a set and using push to push new items onto an array. Well, we can actually, uh, and we set on insert as well, so we set the first value. We can actually use uh, an update command with an upsert to effectively insert data and get it to pre figure out what that, those data items are over time. And so then if we, uh, if we go through it, so the actual update statement, uh, hang on, let me, just, uh, let me just show you what that looks like in code because I've got it here on the Wait, look at the command line. So, um, uh, have you ever tried to speak, type, and have one of these at the same time? I think the acoustic is good here. Huh? Yeah. I'll stick that there and I'll. There you go. Can you hear me still? Okay, <laughs> so, um, so actually, I'll, I'll just cut and paste this code here because I'm rather than trying to type it all out. Um, and so, what we're doing here is we're just taking a simple for loop and taking a set on insert. Uh, dollar set and these others, and we're just ingesting it. What database? I mean, okay. okay. So if I just put that in there, uh, if we just look at the code, what it's actually doing, it's. Uh, I don't make things bigger. Okay. Um, so it's looping around, it's just generating some random data just for, for, for simplicity. And it's doing an upsert, um, where upsert is true at the bottom. And so it inserts max, min, set on insert. So uh, set on insert only ever sets an attribute when it's first pushed into, when that document's first created, otherwise it won't do anything. So even though we're looping around, if the document's already created, set on insert will do nothing. Uh, the min and max, as we described, is the value is greater than what's already there or less than what's already there, it will, it will set it. Um, and then we've got set to um, set what, uh, what the last price is, and so when we get to the end of this uh, data item, then we'll... Uh, uh, when we get to the end of this list of 100, it will have figured out what the high and the, what the low is. So if we do db dot um, bars dot bar high, uh, dot so so we've got a bunch of data items here, and it's inserted them. And across these values, we can see the high. Uh, well, actually, surprisingly, it's the first value. But uh, how, how did that happen, right? Um, and then the uh, and then the open, of course, is the same value. Uh, and then uh, the closed price is uh, this this one here should be the same as this one right at the bottom, right? Which, as you can see, so you can kind of figure out and pre-compute those. Now, one of the other things which you can kind of so do JavaScript so the random generator. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's JavaScript random, which is obviously not. Um, so the other thing which we can kind of do is, is that's just like a bunch of data which we've pushed into there. The other thing we, I, I, I think is interesting is introducing this idea of, of bucketing into, uh, into this document here. So we've got 100 data items here. Um, let me just uh, go back to the slides. So we've got a bunch of data items. What about we only want, say, 10 of those 100 items per document? And so we can actually introduce, uh, use, bring in this a count or a size into the upsert command. And so if we're inserting this data here, we're actually incrementing a, a counter as well. So we know how many 
data items we've got in this bucket. And once we get to that limit, the upsell will go, hang on, look, S, our size is, is no longer less than 10, and therefore it'll automatically upsell a new document. So if I just take this on here, let me just, uh, take this as cut and paste, school of coding is always better. Uh, especially when in front of a large audience of people. Um, let's uh, show collections. Uh, let's just drop this. So <coughs> start again. Let's put this new code in. So if we look there, it's, uh, it's iterated around, it's incremented the value, and what we should find is that of these 100 items, we should actually have uh, quite a few documents. Or we better do, otherwise it's going to That doesn't look quite right. Make that pretty. And so we kind of, as we iterate around, it generates a bunch of documents for each one. Each one we can see here, oh, that's a bit better look. The high is not the first one. Uh, the low is not the last one. It's somewhere in the middle here. And the open and the close. So, so you can see that you can kind of bucket that data together uh, quite effectively. And it's a single operation. You're using it as an in, using that update with, update with upsert to automatically bucket data together into individual items, insert that into, into the database. So good for thing, all kinds of things like you know, any data which we receive that you want to bucket. So once you have 10 buckets like this, then how do you know where you can insert? Do you have to go through all of them and check this counter and find the first one which, which is not full yet? So no, the, it's a purely based on the upsert. This, this command here, the update will automatically push it into the next one. In reality, you, in reality, you'd probably want to stick some other things like uh, a timestamp in there as well uh, and various indexing metrics because you probably want to say, I want to just query the last two or three buckets or I want the last bucket there. So, um, so you could do it in a bunch of different ways, but probably time, certainly in this example, it probably timestamp and some description would make most sense. Um, yeah. Certainly in financial data like this, you're, you're more likely to do it based on time anyway. Uh, but if you're saying I'm just taking a bunch of tweets uh, from feeds that I want to bucket together or uh, maybe I've got some kind of telco app where I want to store call data records or maybe some of the metric system where we just want to have the last buckets of data, uh, then storing it in this way kind of gives you, uh, allows you to get the last kind of complete data. Of course, the other thing that you want to do is if I only want to get the last complete bucket, then you probably want to query on. Uh, by time and where the obviously where the, the size is is equal to ten effectively. Okay, so uh, I think that was about all I had to say. Just uh, can't remember what else I had to say in here. Yeah, that was the last slide. So uh, to summarize what we've talked about: um, ingesting large quantities of data, whatever type, social metrics financial data, you name it, uh, I guess the key things. How do you want to store that data? Do you want to store that data on a uh, data point per document? Or is it more effective for you to group that data together to have multiple data points per document? And where you can store multiple data points per document, you can effectively get some pretty, pretty high ingestion rates of that data, um, as we've been seeing. Uh, the <coughs> next kind of question is, of all those massive amounts of data points that I want to query, that, that I want to keep, uh, do I need to keep all of them transparent uh, to me as, a Mongo, as I query MongoDB, or do I need to initially keep them transparent? And so, for instance, if I can make, store that data in an op opaque way, it gives us the ability to do things like compress data and batch it together and compress it and, and get an even greater effective uh, ingestion in, in rate. Um, the other thing we talked about was looking at how we could, uh, how do we shard, how do we shard, do we shard on a single server? If we've got very, very high I.O., uh, then actually we might get better throughput through the, the notion of, I guess, micro sharding, where we have a sharded system on a single box, leveraging uh, as many of those IOPs as humanly possible. And, then, and finally, kind of, can we bucket that data? When we do updates, when we do those insertions, uh, when we do updates, can we get to do some pre-aggregation, do some pre-computation of that data and store that uh, uh, to give us interesting things. All right, I hope that was interesting. I hope that gave you some things to chew on and think about. Um,
any questions, give us a shout, and uh, I shall be... We're going somewhere for a well-earned beer. Yeah, um, we do. So, happy to take questions afterwards. Thanks very much. Thanks.